Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel and uh, I know I haven't done one of these in a long time. Um, mostly I've been uploading performances and the podcast with uh, James Corbett on the Beatles. But I was just watching a rather remarkable uh, video um, on YouTube off the Dark Journalist channel and in there he's um, interviewing the remarkable genius uh, Joe Farrell, Joseph Farrell, who seems to know everything about everything. The guy is an incredible scholar and in fact he's an Oxford scholar. So um, anyway, but uh, I hadn't known it before because he's done a lot of research into conspiracy theory and parapolitics and all that sort of thing and also uh, very much the paranormal as well, which is always fascinating stuff to me. But um, this time he started talking about music and I didn't even know he was a musician. Apparently he had acquired uh, the sound samples for his keyboard uh, for the uh, standard church organs. And some of these organs were built on very objective principles um, to evoke a certain state inside of a human being meant to be positive actually um, and uh, he talks about uh, some of the things some of the subjects I've uh, been harping on which includes temperament of the scale and how radical a change that was um, he says exactly some of the same things I say regarding uh, prior to temperament keys you couldn't play in more than one key which was a big big massive problem in music which was solved by the clever European mind. And in fact, um, Johann Sebastian Bach helped in that. And that's why he wrote his, uh, his uh, well-tempered clavier, um, which, by the way, I mean, prior to this, there were 12 keys, 12 major keys. There were no minor keys whatsoever. They hadn't existed yet because of the very reason that you couldn't Im import a single note from another uh, key, otherwise it would sound bad. Um, but with the equal temperament system, now we can import not only notes, but full chords and modulate to different keys and all this. In any case, I'm uh, appending to this uh, video uh, the interview that Daniel List, uh, a.k.a. Dark Journalist, uh, has with Joseph Farrell uh, on the one little segment. It's a two-hour clip. I'm just giving you 20 minutes of... Um, just some really cool insights into the development of uh, music and how music, the art of music, degraded over time uh, to the present time. Uh, and uh, I just, I found the whole thing fascinating, actually. And he probably touches on a few points you've heard before about the CIA's involvement in uh, uh, changing art in the 20th century, not just music, but art, too, where... Uh, Anything that was radical and cacophonous, they were pr pr promoting this sort of thing um, actively. They were actively involved. So I think uh, you'll find some of this stuff really very interesting and enlightening, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so with no further ado, I bring you uh, Daniel List and the incredible, inimitable Joseph Farrell. Enjoy. I know that you, uh, before we get into it, I want to mention that you've been working on this organ project for producing, <laughs> and uh, it was quite a challenging thing to do because you actually uh, played organ in that certain special organ that you only get in certain types of cathedrals, and you, you actually reconstructed it uh, on an electronic basis so you could do it directly where you were in your own studio. How's that going? Uh, just fine, except for being 30 years out of practice doesn't help. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's going just fine. Um, it's a it's a virtual pipe organ, which means that it, that they take digital sound samples of famous organs, and you can actually play those instruments in your home. So I have four different uh, four different organs on it, a nice big uh, German harpsichord on it as well so it'll double as a pedal harpsichord and uh, I did a little I did a little demonstration of stops in the harmonic series and how that works uh, in my members area for on my website so if people want to hear the organ uh, they can go and look up that that demo it's about 20 25 minutes long it's not too long just demonstrating stops and how it works and how the harmonic series is all a part of it, but it's 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 fun. I can tell you that wow. <laughs> I'm yeah. enjoying it. It sounds fun. One of the things that grabs me about the pipe organs uh, also is, from what I understand about it, the 
the incredible interaction physically mm -hmm. with an organ like that, it's a lot different than just playing piano or something. I mean, it's yeah. Whole, it's almost like having a drum kit or something. You have to use your whole body. You have to use your whole body. Um, and the thing that's very different about a pipe organ from any other musical instrument is the building itself is the wave mixer. So you're sitting, in a certain sense, you're sitting inside the instrument rather than outside of it. So it's it's a very different experience playing them. And of course, on, on those big instruments, you can feel I mean, there's, those instruments can shake the building. Wow. So you can feel the, the effect it has on you physiologically. And it's, it's, it's an awesome experience playing them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so interesting to me, too. Uh, you actually have to wear certain types of clothing to do it, too. Well, you have to wear shoes. Uh, oh. uh, it's, it's recommended you wear a special kind of shoe with a very thin sole. And a kind of a built up uh, a built up heel to play those things because you do a lot of pedal work on them. Um, the other kind of clothing you don't really have to. I dress up, you know. You see me in my practice garb here. I just got done practicing. You did uh, before you we started the show. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they're a serious oh. instrument, so I dress seriously. I appreciate I it. Um, one thing I want to mention there too is, well, I want to ask you, how long before people will get to hear kind of the fruits of your? Uh, uh, it's going to be a while. Um, I did play a little bit of a few pieces in that demo, not very much. Uh, it'll be a while, but I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, of doing a video if I can get certain pieces back under my fingers and feet again, which, <laughs> which is iffy at the present time. <laughs> but but uh, I'm planning to do a video eventually of, of some pieces and demonstrate, uh, demonstrate what I talk about in, in the Microcosm Medium book. Uh, demonstrate the affect, uh, the affect in Lara, the the cosmology that those Baroque composers were composing out of, so that people can actually see what's going on. Uh, because there, the 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 thing about that era of music is that it's not painting pictures; they're using rhetorical devices, so they're speaking rather than painting. So once you once you get acclimatized to listen for certain things, you know the figurations and so on, what they're doing. Oh. Um, it's, it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very intensive cosmology once you understand it. And, uh, these, these composers, they weren't artists so much as they were craftsmen mm -hmm. and they were practicing in a tradition. They were trying to hand down a very, very long, uh, tradition of composition and they did so very successfully, but, uh, once you once you understand it and see how it couples to the organ and then understand you know just to just to kind of sweeten the pot a little bit a church standard church is built in a cruciform pattern mm -hmm. which if you look at it from the standpoint of hyperdimensional physics the cruciform pattern is a three-dimensional analog of a tesseract which is a hypercube in other words a cube in four dimensions okay so you're using the instrument itself quite literally to vibrate intentionality and information into the field of the earth itself and that's uh that's cosmological manipulation quite frankly when it gets right down to it those ancient cultures understood the power of music of oh yes sound and they vouchsafed a lot of interesting truths mm -hmm. inside of those systems and right you start in there actually with uh pythagoras and right. so much that comes out of that tradition and you mentioned that uh, the cosmology, the foundation is reason. Right. Or ratio. Can you explain? Ratio. Um, yeah, for the, for the Baroque era, you've got two major influences going on in the cosmology. You've got the Christian influence, you know, incarnation, logos becomes flesh, and so on. And then you have the humanist tradition from the Renaissance, uh, which dates back to Plato, ultimately back to Pythagoras. And if you look at that cosmology, it's really the case, and I've, I've said this in other books, Grid of the Gods, when you look at the modern Western system of tempering, it's, this is something that's very important for people to understand. In the natural harmonic series, you cannot change keys in the course of a piece. Okay. 
And that's because there's a natural overtone in the harmonic series. If you take C as a fundamental, it's the fifth overtone. That fifth overtone lies between the notes A natural and B flat. It's in the crack. It's that blues note, you know, if you're listening to blues, right. it's that note that's kind of in the crack. And the first unification in physics occurs when they figure out if they tweak the mathematical adjustment of the harmonic series just a little bit, you get 12 equidistant keys, you know, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and so on. You get those 12 chromatic notes, and you can modulate during the course of a piece from one key to another smoothly and effortlessly. I think that discovery was known to Plato. I go into it in the book as to why it was known to Plato. I think it was probably known to the Pythagoreans. It was their big secret. And for them, the cosmology, the music of the spheres, the planets, you know, they had this idea that the planets, the sun, give off their own unique frequency, which in fact they do. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this, was a, this was a discovery that was confirmed in modern physics in the 19th century with the Schumann resonance. So they had this idea that music is itself an expression of cosmology. And therefore, if you learned how to manipulate the harmonies, the music itself, you were in fact impressing information into the cosmological field of information. So it's for these people, it's a very, very serious thing. It's it's the big secret. And you know, I've talked about this in Babylon's Banksters. Uh, David Bohm, the famous physicist, tried to even take that idea a step further by coming out with the unifying mathematical interval for the whole harmonic series, not just the audible harmonic series. Mm. And, you know, being an organist, you know, you grow up with the harmonic series, just learning how to use stops, right? Because the stops are based on the harmonic series. So you, you literally grow up with it and you're playing an instrument that spans the entire range of human hearing, you know, from the very bottom to the very top. So you, you grow up with this idea that there's a cosmology at work in, in music, and certainly the Baroque composers understood that and, and intentionally uh, composed on that basis. But getting back to your idea of ratio, when you translate the Greek word logos into Latin, the word is ratio. And ratio in Latin can mean both reason but it also means ratio in the arithmetic sense, proportion. And of course, that's the basis of the harmonic series. Wow. So you get the Lutheran, you know, by the time you get to the Lutheran Reformation, you've got Luther uh, literally coming and creating a, a theology of music based on this idea of ratio, reason, incarnation, and so on and so forth. So it's definitely a part of their thinking. Fascinating. Um, the Pythagoreans were harkening back to an older tradition themselves. Yes. It was embedded in the Egyptian methods. Mm -hmm. Right. The, um, some of the things you've pointed out about in your work on the Giza Death Star with the Great Pyramid, which I find so interesting, is that the pyramid itself is, in, in some sense, a chamber of resonance. Yes. And you demonstrated that by showing that there's a there's a, it's not a straight line on every side. There's a bowing when right. you look at it overhead. Um, can you describe that a little bit? Well, the pyramid. If you look at the faces of the pyramid, top down, uh -huh. you'll discover that along the apothem, which is the line that runs through the center of of the sides of the pyramid, along the apothem, it's actually bent in. So you're dealing with, in effect, you're dealing with parabolic reflectors on all four sides. So it's created to, to gather information, it's created to gather electromagnetic input, but it's also resonant to the Schumann cavity resonance of the planet. Okay. So in other words, you know, they're thinking along the same lines of these people building these big organs in the churches. They're using, they're using the building as a resonating chamber to be resonant to the earth. And I think both to gather uh, harmonics from the earth as well as project information harmonics into the earth. So it's a two-way thing and that parabolic reflector aspect of, of the Great Pyramid is not something well known but that that's kind of the dead giveaway right there. 
Wow, uh, it's fascinating. It reminds me of the Casey work when he they asked him how the pyramids were built, and he made a few comments about it, but one of them was in reference to sound. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. And now we got a little bit of that, and we start to understand how vibration is. Miss Olivia, you have some. Okay, I've, I already have a great uh, series of questions here. Okay, well, so, yeah. Uh, Nimza wants to know, so the liturgy focuses the group intention, and the, yes. or and the organ vibrates it into the medium? Yes. One that's one. that's exactly what I personally think is going on. Yes, absolutely. And, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Nicholas Krupas wants to know uh, if the pipe organ is an analog of Gregorian chant. Similar effect? Uh, no. Uh, Gregorian chant is is something that is still being based on the natural harmonic series, if you listen to it uh, performed properly. Uh, so they don't have that mathematical adjustment that we call tempering that allows you to modulate from one key to another during the course of the piece. Um, that comes, I think, as a product of, of the Renaissance when that whole secret tradition, again, going back to Plato and Pythagoras, comes out into the open. In other words, what I'm saying is the Western tonal system was known to Plato. It was known to Pythagoras, but it was not put out publicly so that the music you heard was unlike the music we hear now. Mm -hmm. It's it's that it's that blossoming in the Renaissance when it comes out into the public that you see this this tonal system begin to take hold. And you know, every everybody from Bach to the Beatles has been using it ever since. Right. Because right. it allows that change of key during the course of the piece of music. Right. Yeah. Um well, wow, this is really fascinating. What you are kind of describing here is that the music is used to uplift the culture and the people to a higher vibration, right. a higher way of thinking. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about what happens when that system is degraded mm -hmm. and what would be the benefits for the people who are organizing that kind of degradation as you spell out in the book uh, with art, with culture, with music, there was a steady degeneration of factors to mm -hmm. and it kind of on a mass of uh, the mass effect that it has is to degrade the cultural thinking and mm -hmm. the reference points for different mm -hmm. types of uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. So um, when did that start to occur? When do you see this becoming the dominant pattern? Well, for me, music and art are a soft form of mind manipulation. So in other words, you can take any art, any music, and it's already by dint of the fact of being art or being music, it's a form of mind manipulation. But there is a dramatic change in the cosmology, the, the philosophical thinking behind particularly music from the Baroque to the classical and romantic. And it's important for people to understand this is not a, uh, this is not a historical progression. It's a stylistic and cosmological shift because the Baroque style of music overlaps in time with the classical style and continues on for a while, uh, all the way up to the turn of the century with certain composers. What happens is that in the, in the Baroque cosmology, in the, in the doctrine that those composers used, J.S. Bach, C.P.E. Bach, uh, Buxtehude, you know, people like this, they, they viewed the production of art, the production of music, as being something to create an affect. And by affect, they meant the conjuring of passions that are common to human nature. So in other words, they were not interested in personal expression or originality. There were certain formulas that were used to conjure an emotional response in the listener. And if you if you doubt that that's possible, just think of film music. Uh, you get film composers, uh, Mancini, Jerry Goldsmith, and people like this, John Williams, that will use certain musical procedures when they want to conjure a particular emotional effect in the listener. Right. So it's a very objective thing that they're talking about. They're not interested in personal emotional expression or communicating their subjective emotions to the listener. Beginning with the classical era and particularly with the romantic composers, 
they jettison that cosmology. So in other words, look what's happening, to put it in theological terms. The Baroque composer is trying to ground his personhood in the natural, in the common human nature. That all gets flipped with the Romantic era because now it's personal expression that predominates over and sometimes in opposition to the human nature and therefore to those musical procedures that were designed to conjure certain emotional responses. And the ultimate end of this is you get people like Arnold Schoenberg, you know, with the 12 tone system writing this God awful ugliness in the name of the democratization. And I'm using a, an expression that Leonard Bernstein uses to describe Schoenberg's music to describe the democratization of all 12 notes so that you're jettisoning this whole idea of a universal harmonic law and set of rules that you follow when you compose. Now, the interesting thing here is that after World War II, the CIA steps in and starts promoting this modernism in all of the arts, in music, in painting, you know, they're pushing Jackson Pollock. And, and the reason they're doing this is they're trying to say, okay, look at those poor Soviet composers and artists that are having to compose under all of these rules, you know, and socialist realism. Whereas over here in free America, you can, you can splatter paint on a canvas and call it art, and we've got all of this freedom. Well, it's the CIA pushing this. Interesting. Okay? Yeah. And that means, you know, that they have, they've understood something that uh, was kind of lost in the 19th century, that there's a cosmology, there's a social and cultural effect that that the arts have and it's a soft form of mind manipulation and by the way you know they don't just do this in classical uh music they do it in popular music too so they're they're trying to infiltrate and and use the arts as a soft form of of mind manipulation and but in the process what they're doing is they're pushing the modernist aesthetic which is an aesthetic of absolute originality to be to be artistic, you have to be original, jettison the rules, and compose ugliness. And it gets more and more ugly the more you listen to that stuff. I think it's so interesting when you think about what the Central Intelligence Agency was created for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very interesting the, the avenues that they get into to mm -hmm. manipulate and socially engineer the culture. Mm -hmm. um, way outside of their mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. And, you know, we can look at it on the ground and say, well, you know, it's the CIA has their own Air Force. I mean, that's also unusual. Right. But when we talk about the manipulating culture, that's not something that anyone would really think, oh, you know, they have a regular hand in that. Well, they absolutely do. Yeah, they do. Uh, you know, I point out in the book that they are sponsoring the, the modern music conferences in Rome during the 1950s. And they're, they're, you know, they're, they're highlighting composers like Stravinsky and Schoenberg and Alban Berg and so on. And, you know, I challenge anybody to go out and try and listen to those people for more than five minutes before you shut it off. Because it's just, <laughs> it's just god awful ugly, you know, and I'm the enfant terrible and I'm willing to say it's ugly. Well, they're pushing this for precisely the reason to show, well, the West, you have all of this freedom, you can do whatever you want to and produce ugliness. And that's why I think the culture is becoming so ugly because part of the feedback loop in this is if you are promoting disharmony in music, you're gonna get disharmony in the culture. I mean, that you know, this, yeah. Is, yeah. This, is that, this is that insight of, of cosmology all the way from Pythagoras to Bach, you know, that, that everybody accepted as kind of the, uh, the basis of, uh, of, of their artistic output. So they recognized the arts as a soft form of, of mind manipulation. Yeah. And the CIA, of course, when the CIA is promoting this, what else are they doing? Well, they've got the MK Ultra program going full steam. They're not interested in just the soft forms of mind manipulation, they're interested in the actual heavy duty hard stuff as well. So it's across the board, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a full spectrum dominance sort of thing that you're looking at.